boring. Boring. Boredom is said to be good for you, isn't it? Uh, people are saying that boredom is a necessary part of every child's education, and I'm sure that's all true. But it's still a problem that boredom is boring. There's nothing going on. It's called Things are called boring because they're dull, uneventful, and basically nothing, nothing is happening. Now, we're just studying a series on Mark's Gospel. And uh, when Jesus arrived in his public ministry, as we discover in today's passage, when Jesus arrived in his public ministry, he said, boredom is over. There is no more boredom for the people of God. Instead of nothing happening with Jesus, everything, everything is happening. In verse 15 of chapter 1, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus turned up, went public, and said, The time is now. Every single promise of God, every single aspect of the plan of God throughout all ages, is at completion. The completion has come in the person of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was an important guy, but he wasn't the end point. Every name before Jesus was important, but they're not the end point. Adam and Eve, important, but not the end, not the destination. Abraham and Sarah, important, but not the end point or the destination. King David, all of those people. Everyone's significant, but Jesus turns up and says, I'm it. The time is fulfilled. Jesus is the important point, the end point, the action point of God's plan. And this is the interesting thing that happens in Mark's Gospel. Jesus makes it clear that he is the one who brings in the end of all things, that the kingdom of God is fulfilled in him. And yet that fulfillment in Jesus was met with ignorance. Ignorance and confusion are mixed together when Jesus turns up. He's everything. And people are left thinking, what is going on? The world is confused even though Jesus is the completeness of meaning and reality. On Jesus' side of the picture, there is total command. He is always in charge of the situation in Mark's Gospel. But on the other side, apart from Jesus, there are all these questions and points of confusion. Humans ask questions. There are spiritual questions too. Have a look, for example, in um, Mark 1 from verse 23. At this point, in a synagogue, immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, listen to the question, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Here's an unclean spirit who's infested a man and speaking through the man. And no, we don't know how that happens, we're never told. But listen to the words. This, this spirit knew Jesus' identity, the Holy One of God. That's part of the expectation. That's, um, that's a part of the description of God in the Old Testament. That this spirit knew Jesus' identity, but did not know what Jesus was doing. What are you doing here? Have you come to do that thing? What's going on? I recognize you, said the spirit, but I don't recognize your actions. It was similar later on in the synagogue. Um, all the people who saw that spirit cast out of the man and who'd heard Jesus teaching, all the people saw Jesus' actions, but they didn't get it either. Verse 27, uh, in that same synagogue moment, they were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. What is this? They saw evil defeated. They heard the powerful truth of Jesus. And they said, what? what? We don't get it. Let me go through some real questions from Mark's Gospel, even beyond our passage. People ask, what are you doing? Why are you here? 
What is this? Who is this? Who can be saved? Who gave you this authority? Again and again there are these questions of Jesus. Who is this Jesus character? What is he doing? What's he on about? And to add to this, Jesus asks his own questions as well. He knows the answers, but he, he points these questions into the heart of the people in the day and to us who read. He asks, who are my mother and brothers? Why do you call me good? Who touched me? Who do you say I am? Again, question after question about Jesus. And the only way to answer the questions about Jesus is to be like the folk in the synagogue in chapter 1 of Mark. To hear the teaching of Jesus and to watch his actions. That's the only method by which we can know who Jesus is. To hear the teaching of Jesus and watch his actions. Knowing the title is kind of nice. It's okay, but it's not enough. The, the demon knew that Jesus was the Holy One of God, but he was still confused. The only way to learn truly about Jesus is to listen and to watch. What does he teach? What does he say? No one, no one of us can trust anything else. We can't trust the experts to tell us who Jesus is, as though the experts have more insight than us. We... Um, can't trust our experience to tell us of Jesus. He didn't come to us in a dream and give us a secret that's not otherwise available. Our experience will let us down and confuse us. We can't, we, we can't trust logical connections to teach us about Jesus. We can't say, well, we know he lived in this year and that era in the Middle East, so therefore we can conclude that that's actually not going to do it because he's too surprising. Uh, we, we can't trust meditative practices and silence and emptying our heads to meet Jesus. The, the way to meet Jesus is back into the text. What actually happened? It's a bit like the days when I was in the lab. You have to do the experiment. You have to see what goes on. You can theorize all you want, have ideas on paper, but it's actually what happens that's important. And that's why we're in Mark's Gospel. So what did happen? What was it that happened? Well, what happened was Jesus fulfilled every divine plan. When Jesus turns up, it is no longer a slow news day. It's all action. In verse 18, immediately they followed him. Verse 20, immediately he called them. Verse 21, immediately on the Sabbath. In verse 23, immediately there was this man. And in verse 28, at once... His fame spread. It's all go, go, now, then. It, straight away things are happening. And it's not only that things happen straight away, but there's also a constant sense of movement. Uh, there's, there's transition and happening and movement all the time. They came into Galilee, or he came into Galilee. Uh, they went alongside the sea. Uh, they came away with Jesus. They came to the synagogue. The Spirit came out of the man. And then the fame of Jesus came to every place. Mark is full of motion and activity. And our little passage that we've read today is a great illustration of that. They're always going somewhere. There's always something going on. They're go, go, go all the time. And in the end of our section, did you notice that in verse 28? Jesus' fame seems to have a life of its own. Jesus' fame goes on its own journey. Jesus is doing things, traveling around a little bit. He's in a synagogue. But Jesus' fame sort of picks up its own little basket and goes for a walk by itself, even where Jesus hasn't reached yet. As we keep on in Mark's Gospel, look for that dynamism and activity. Get the sense of everyone being drawn into the power of Jesus. He's like the tide that brings everyone with him. Jesus' fame was well-deserved. His fame went everywhere because, oh, well, he's the guy who's worth knowing about. And when reflecting on that fame, here's something for us to consider. Perhaps this is a useful test for our own Christian life. Does our Christian life increase Jesus' fame? Does our Christian living together 
promote the name and fame and glory of Jesus. If people get to know Albury Bible Church, do they think about Jesus? If people get to know me or you, are they thinking, that person, they're interesting, but they're obsessed with this Jesus guy. It's important that people think about Jesus when they think about what Christians stand for, not thinking about us. In fact, I'm not even really worried if people out there think we have a bad reputation because we're so obsessed with Jesus. Oh, those guys, they're so interested in Jesus. And he was 2,000 years ago. Isn't that irrelevant? I don't care if we get a bad reputation, as long as the reputation is about Jesus, Jesus Christ, and what he did. Do people know that we are about Jesus? Do people know that you are on about Jesus? Not about religion. Not about comfort. Not about good living by any means. No, no, no. We're about Jesus. He is the one to get the fame and the glory. His is the name that we should be speaking. The fame that we should be known for. Well, we want people to be known, really, that we are caught by Jesus. That we've been reeled in by him. We're caught up in his net. We are the fish brought in for Jesus Christ. In the passage today, we met uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John, two sets of brothers. And those four guys are different from us. They're apostles for a start. And, well, there's only a dozen of those. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus. Certainly there were more eyewitnesses, but that doesn't include me. Um, but despite their difference, they still remain somewhat examples for us about what it is to respond to Jesus' command. Jesus gave the command to everybody in verse 15, and they are the first people who are shown responding. Verse 15, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. There's his double command. Repent and believe in the gospel. What does that look like? Well, for Peter and Andrew, James and John, that looked like them following him. And I think following is what all disciples do. Jesus turned to them and said, follow me. I have a new task for you. It's interesting. Jesus took them from the fishing industry because Jesus was setting up a new industry of fishing. Fishing for people, not fishing for swimming things. <laughs> it's fishing for people like us, catching people to live for the kingdom of God. So though we're not the same as Peter, Andrew, James and John, we can say that we're all in this new business in one way or another. Every Christian is employed in the business of fishing for people. You don't have to be an apostle. You don't have to be an eyewitness. You don't have to be the pastor of a church. You don't have to be a missionary. But everybody contributes, just like in a big company. Everybody contributes to the same goal. Now, at this point, we could talk about this um, business of catching people by speaking of helping others outside of our church, say, to repent and believe. And that's a fantastic thing to do. We should be learning how to do that. But I want us to think a little bit differently today. Um, helping others to repent and believe is fine. Please, please, let's talk about how to do that. But I want us to get personal. Why don't we do that? Because we need to consider the life of repentance and faith. If repentance and faith is important for the whole world, well, it starts with us. And starting with us, it can then overflow and be understood and be explained much better. What does repentance and faith in the gospel look like? Repentance, I think, starts with starts with acknowledging that we're full of sin. Starts with accepting our problem. And with that acknowledgement, we turn from every error that we commit. In, in truth, we agree with God our judge that what we've been accused of, we are actually guilty of. Repentance involves our mind. It does a, involve a rethinking, but it involves our mind and the whole of our life as well. A repentance in mind alone is no repentance. 
that's just positive thinking or that's just sorrowful thinking. I don't know what it is, but it's not a full repentance. Because repentance involves tears. Inventive, repentance involves apologies. Repentance involves a reordering of life. And really, repentance is faith. Repentance needs faith. True repentance is an act of faith. Because to repent is not to act upon our own power. No, no, repentance isn't something I do. Repentance is a gift from God to me or to you. Repentance is to change by the power of Jesus and by the power of his gospel. That's why it's repent and believe. It reminds us that the power to repent is a gift from God, a gift that we trust in. Repent and believe are like two sides of the same piece of paper. You can't have a one-sided bit of paper that's just flat. It's, you got repent and believe. They always come together in the gospel. The gospel it is that tells us of our sin. So if we trust that message, if we believe that message, we repent from sin. That is our faith changing us. Uh, the gospel tells us that only Jesus Christ washes away sin. So to trust that, to believe that gospel, will be to repent of self-improvement, self-trust, or trusting any other method apart from Jesus. And the Gospel tells us that Jesus' power really changes us. Do you believe that? To believe that message is to live out that change, and to love God and neighbour as ourself. For the Christian, boredom is well and truly out of date. Boredom is a thing of the past. We cannot say ever again, nothing's happening. Because of Jesus, and because of Jesus' gospel, there is action and movement and power, and there is amazement in our world, even in our own lives. We'll learn of Jesus' action by close attention to his words and to his activity. That's why we're in Mark's gospel. And as we pay that close attention with faith, we discover the great news that part of Christ's continuing action in this world is action in our own life, the life of repentance and faith. That's something to give thanks for, isn't it? So I'm going to do that and give thanks now. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that in Jesus the time is fulfilled. Thank you that in Jesus your actions, your plans come to their completion. And we thank you that Jesus is the one with authority to teach and to act uh, as the ruler, the king in your kingdom. We thank you also, Father, that uh, Jesus calls people to repent and believe that we have a chance to accept that gospel message. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us the strength to repent and believe, the spirit to turn to Christ in faith and to trust that repentance is the right way forward. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for making our lives transforming now. And we pray that uh, we will be people who don't um, get confused at Jesus, but that we will wonder at his greatness with praise on our lips, praise and thanks in our heart. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.